Well, hey, good morning. Glad you could join us this morning as we gather together for worship. Um, Pastor Chad Palmer with Mohican Church, and uh, we're glad that even if you can't join us here in person today, uh, we're glad that you can join us um, by way of video. We're going to be going to the Word today in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and, um, and so we'll be getting there in a little bit. This is Father's Day today, and, um, and so we are recognizing God's gift of fathers and, um, and, and, and perhaps giving a little bit of encouragement uh, and motivation of mission to, uh, to some men and fathers out there today as we look into the Word. And so, uh, again, glad you're here to join us. We're going to be getting into the Word here in a minute, uh, but first join me if you would as we go to prayer. Father God, this day I praise you that we have the opportunity to gather for worship. I'm grateful, Lord, that even as I addressed you at the beginning of this prayer a minute ago, that you call yourself our Father. Well, there are various times in the Scriptures that you, uh, that's, that's one of the ways you reveal yourself to us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for that because, um, well, because we can, many of us relate to that. I know that there are many of us that also have, uh, don't have a very godly example of an earthly father. I thank you, Lord, to know that while well, you make up that lack, I'm thankful that we can relate to you as father, and I'm so thankful for the love that you pour out upon us, you, you bestow upon us, and I'm thankful that we can come together into your word and we can look to see what it is that you have to say to us. And we are grateful for the earthly role of Father. Today it is a weighty and a, and a mighty task. And, and we are grateful that you enable us as, as men to, to do this thing. I pray that this day, Lord, uh, primarily would you stir up our hearts to worship you, to know you for who you are, and to, uh, to, to love you and to adore you. And secondarily, Lord, I pray that you would help us to to be very grateful that, that you have given us fathers in our lives. And even if we don't have a good one ourselves, and I thank you that, that there are those around us that, that we can benefit from, we can appreciate, and we can encourage. And so help us to do that. So today, as always, Lord, as we prepare to open up your word, we, pre we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would teach us. Lord, that you would help us to see your word, uh, even in spite of these faulty lips. Uh, that, that we would know you, and that you would transform us. That we would be able to apply your word to our lives, and, and that tomorrow would be different because of what it is that we've seen in your word today. And so, Lord, we wait upon you with great expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well... We are going off of our uh, the the series that we've been in in the mornings at Mohican has uh, been in Romans in the book of Romans and we are we are taking a break from that this morning as we uh, as we consider men as we consider fathers and the title of the sermon today is men with mission men with mission. The text that we're going to be primarily in here in just a little bit is 1 Corinthians 16, the two verses, verse 13 and 14. As we consider men and fathers, and, and I am, I, I am uh, referencing both of those today because this message is, uh, is, is about fathers, but it is about men in general as well. God designed the, the, the role of, of man and, and fathers with purpose. There's this role that he designed. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, uh, an equality thing, you know, better than, but, but God designed, just like he designed every role, he designed the role of man and father from the beginning. I think it's something that we need to be aware of men because again we're not necessarily in a culture that 
tends to applaud men or fathers. I think we need to understand that, that some of our roles, because sometimes we can be hesitant to step into them, we can, um, we can be hesitant because of, uh, because of we're not sure how it's going to be received, or frankly, we don't even know what it's supposed to look like. We, we need to understand, and this isn't going to be comprehensive necessarily, but we need to understand that, that, that God has designed men and fathers as spiritual leaders and and one of the things that we see from the scriptures is God has designed us as protectors and, and providers. And the, the role of fathers is extremely important. And we see more and more in, in our world today that uh, where, where fathers are absent. And now sometimes that's because of death. Sometimes that's because of dereliction of duty. But but the role of fathers is, is, is greatly important. There are some statistics that I just want to share with you here simply, uh, simply to, to underscore uh, what I just said, that, that the role of fathers is very, very important. I actually, I actually have the, the sources of these stats if you'd like to get a hold of me later, but... 82% of studies on father involvement and child well-being published since 1980 found significant associations between positive father involvement and offspring well-being. Another one says that in an analysis of over 100 studies on parent-child relationships, it was found that having a loving and nurturing father was as important for a child's happiness, well-being, and social and academic success as having a loving and nurturing mother. Some studies even indicated father love was a stronger contributor to some important positive child well-being outcomes. Also, according to child psychi psychiatrist Kyle Pruitt, a father's more active play style and comparatively slower response to a toddler or infant experiencing frustration served to promote problem-solving competencies and independence in the child. Another one, in the words of Dr. Pruitt, positive father care is associated with more pro-social and positive moral behavior in boys and girls. This is borne out by research from the University of Pennsylvania, which indicates that children who feel a closeness and warmth with their father are twice as likely to enter college, 75% less likely to have a child in their teen years, 80% less likely to be incarcerated, and half as likely to show various signs of depression. And finally, in a 26-year-long study, researchers found that the number one factor in developing empathy in children was father involvement. Fathers spending regular time alone with their children translated to children who became compassionate adults. Those are some pretty staggering statistics. And they're, they're pretty eye-opening statistics, and, and that's just a few. There are many, many that we could go into. And these statistics really should perhaps be both encouraging and convicting to us men and to us dads. Perhaps helping us to see the gravity, you know, because we see the, the consequences or the, the results of, of our, our labors in our role. As dead. And so it should be encouraging and also convicting at the same time. But like I mentioned before, there are many who, who don't have fathers in their lives. Perhaps that's you. Perhaps you're a mother who um, your, your child's father is not in their life because of death or dereliction of duty, one or the other. And, and either way, there's not that influence in their life. I, I want you to hear this when I say this. Hearing these statistics perhaps could cause you some angst and, and great discouragement. But I want you to understand this is not a sentence. Fatherlessness is not a sentence that, that means therefore your children are going to, or you are going to turn out less than you should. It's not a sentence. I would encourage you in this, if this, if this is you, I want you 
I want you to do this. Look to the Lord in His strength and seek His face always. God is faithful. And He is the one who is able to make up lack. All right? He, he has, by the way, called Himself our Father. And I would encourage you also to do this. I would also encourage you to do what you can to encourage other godly male influence in your life or your child's life. Because even if it isn't a biological father, and even if it isn't somebody that you would call your father or your child's father, that influence, that father-type figure, will be essential. The point of this is, is, is that the role of men and fathers is a God-given and essential role in the life of the home and in the life of kids. And I would go further by saying, in the life of society as a whole. The role of men and fathers is essential in, in, in that, too. But i got to tell you that there's a struggle in, in, in men. Oh, there are many struggles in men. But being a man can be a lonely thing. Being a dad can be a lonely thing. And some of you out there know absolutely what I'm talking about. Especially in a culture that tends to look down on masculinity and downplays and, and even shames the role of father. Perhaps you've heard in recent years uh, a phrase that really irritates me. And the phrase is toxic masculinity. And what is typically meant by that is, is looking down at, at every form of masculinity, at, at all masculinity, looking at it as something toxic. I can tell you that when you live in a culture that, that really looks down on the role of, of men and fathers, it's really tough. It's really tough to go about fulfilling your role as, as God has intended it, when you're feeling all the opposition from the outside, it can be. It can be a lonely, lonely thing. Perhaps you've even noticed that men oftentimes are portrayed as either weak buffoons or brash jerks in shows and in movies. You tend to have one or two of, of the end, ends of those spectrum, or that spectrum, that you got the weak buffoon as the dad, as the father, as the man in the picture, or you've got one that is just a brash, harsh, grating jerk. I can tell you that these views can either cause men to conform to one or the other of those images. Because that's what that's what is, is being preached, that's what is being uh, expected or out of lack of, of, of felt purpose or out of discouragement, men can turn inward and, and try to find purpose and comfort in many other things. I just want to encourage you men that the role that God has given to you is on purpose and has a mission. Listen, men need to be assured uh, that what they're doing actually matters. Most men that I know, they have no desire to just be busy. They have no desire to just do busy work. They have a desire to actually have impact and do something that matters in the world. And so men have, have a, a need to be assured that what they're doing matters, and they have a need to have clarity of mission. You men, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, know what I'm talking about. To, to have clarity of mission, not to, not to just be wandering about aimlessly, not quite sure what it is that we should be doing. And so as we get into this text today, my, my, my desire is, is essentially to, to encourage you by, by, number one, telling you that the role that you have been put in, you've been given, is a role designed by God on purpose. But also, I want you to have clarity of mission. I want you, as you go from, from here, I want you to consider some of these things that God is calling us to. Even among all the voices that, 
that perhaps out there that you hear on, you know, it's all static, it's just all static. You know, the ones that downplay the, the role of, of a dad. And I want you to, I want you to, to, to focus on mission. That's one of the things that, uh, that is essential for a unit going out to battle. They have to be focused on mission. If they're not focused on mission, that they get distracted by all kinds of things and they become ineffective. And that's not what we want. We need to have a focus of mission. And so as we look through these uh, couple of verses, just a couple of verses today, I want you to, uh, to consider what it is that God is calling us to do. And this is as the Apostle Paul is closing out his first letter to the Corinthians. And he's kind of wrapping this up and, and, and he's giving them some points here. He says, be this, do this. Sometimes as guys, we need very, very short, succinct commands. Right? Do this, be this. Because we tend to like to, to be in a box. We tend to like to think, okay, I need to do this right now. This is what I need to aim for. Not any of this other fluff. This is what I need to be about. And so that's part of what I like about in verse 13 and 14 as the Apostle Paul is closing out this letter to the Corinthians. He's giving these short commands. And of course, we're not going to leave them to short commands. We're going to expand them a little bit to help us to understand what it is he's calling us to. But this is how it reads. I'm reading today out of the ESV. This is 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 13 to 14, and here is what it says. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And let all that you do be done in love. Again, very, very brief statements on, on how it is that we should be. First, be watchful. And by the way, not sure that we're going to have time to, to actually get into the book of Nehemiah today. Nehemiah chapter 4, I want you to write that down and you can go to it later. But, but as, we, uh, as we go through this, I, I want you to notice at some point, as you dig into it, I want you to notice that, that there are some, uh, some, some illustrations. We see this illustrated in Nehemiah's life, you know, specifically in chapter 4, as he is called to build a wall. He has a mission. And see how it is he goes about it. Check out the parallels there. But first, be watchful. We're called to be watchful. I don't know about you, but there are times that, well, every time, I guess, <laughs> that I go into a restaurant. Or I go into any, any given room if we're going out someplace. And, and where is the seat that I'm most likely to sit in? If we're going to roll up to a booth or to a table with chairs, my wife already knows that the first seat that I'm going to go toward, my kids know this too, and so they'll tend to stay away from that one. <laughs> and it's going to be one of the seats that, that has my back uh, fairly to the wall to where I'm able to see what's going on in the restaurant or whatever room I'm in. And so then I'm going to be more likely to see the, the doors and, and kind of get a sense of the room. Why is that? Is it because I'm paranoid? I mean, I don't think so. Some might think so, <laughs> but, but it's because I want to be alert. I want to pay attention to what's going on. And I don't think that's all bad. We're told a lot of times to keep your head on a swivel. And what that means is pay attention to what's going on around you. I, I tell my children the same thing. I tell my kids, you need to be alert. Don't go through life uh, looking down at your phone. Don't go through life being totally unaware of what's going on around you. We had this happen, oh, it's been a while back now. It was shortly after my truck got stolen right out of our driveway. So that kind of increased the awareness as well. But, uh, but my kids were outside and they, they saw this, uh, the fifth time the same vehicle went down the road real slowly past our driveway, only going from the north to the south. My kids ran in because they were aware of it. They said, Dad, this is going on. This person's driving real so they keep coming past. They keep coming past in the same way. And, and, and uh, so they were very alert. They knew what, they knew what the vehicle looked like, and any, any writing that might have been on the back. And they were very aware. Turns out it was nothing. It was somebody looking for a lost dog. 
But the point is, we are to be alert. We're to be watchful. And the scriptures right here, the Apostle Paul, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, be watchful. And so men, I'm calling you to be watchful. But what it means is to keep awake, to be vigilant, to be watchful, to give strict attention to, to take heed, lest, listen to this, take heed, lest through indolence, which means avoidance of activity or exertion or laziness, some destructive calamity overtake one. It's a sense of we need to, to be very alert, number one, what's going on, so that we are not inactive and let destruction happen. And let things happen that, that is a calamity to overtake. Men be watchful. And this is not a paranoid watchfulness. But this is a watchfulness because we have to understand that the enemy of our souls is seeking whom he may devour. And frankly, men, dads, you, you have to understand that you have an enemy, and it's not the culture out there. You have an enemy, which is, is Satan and his demons, and they would love to have you for lunch. They would love to take your knees out. Because what happens when they take your knees out, it affects the entire family. And it will affect the, affect the entire culture. Scripture in, in uh, the book of Corinthians says, If you think you stand, take heed, or watch out, lest you fall. If you think you stand, take heed, lest you fall. And what he's talking about there is, is temptation and, and fighting temptation. And there are times where we are totally unaware, we are blissfully numb. Uh, perhaps we're engaged in whatever activity and we're, we're just numb. And we're not paying attention. And the Apostle Paul says, be very careful. Be alert and aware. Because when you are least expecting it, you are going to fall. You are going to get hit with temptation. Because again, the enemy is cunning. The enemy is strategic. And he wants to take you out. And so the Apostle Paul says here to be alert. But it's more than just about us. It's more than just watchfulness on our own account, on our own behalf. We have a responsibility, men, to our wives and to our children and to those around us. I think we need, to, we need some mission clarity that it's not just about us. Everything in our, uh, in our nature, everything in our culture would, would help us to suggest that everything's about me, everything's about us. And that's not limited to men, that's everybody. That's the... the the selfish, sinful nature. But this watchfulness is not just for us. Listen, men, as we desire this clarity of mission, listen, we have responsibility to our wives. We have responsibility to our children. And we have responsibility to those around us. What does this look like? To be watchful. Well, as we think about what the Apostle Paul said in, in Corinthians where it says, take heed lest you fall, we have the responsibility to, to essentially keep our back to the wall. Uh, not physically, though that's not bad. But we have the responsibility to keep our back to the wall, spiritually speaking, and to be alert, to be watchful, to do what we're doing, to, to enjoy what we're doing and, and, and do life, but, but to be aware of, of the, the, the doorways and to be aware of of, of everything going on around us. We have the responsibility to do that, but we also, for our own account, but we also have the responsibility to our wives and our children, and frankly, everybody else around us, somebody else's children, our brothers, our sisters, to essentially have our back to the wall spiritually so we are aware of danger that's coming. And I don't just mean physical danger of those breaking through the doors with guns, though, though I do believe we need to be alert. We've been called to be alert and to, to be active. But spiritually speaking, to watch out for danger. Watch out for, for potential danger, uh, spiritually speaking, as we, we watch our children. I mean, what are, what, are they, what are they dealing with? What are they messing with? What, are they, what kind of people are they around? 
or the kind of places they're going. We have the responsibility to be watchful on their account. And i got to tell you, the watchfulness isn't what he's calling us to watchfulness. It's not essentially saying, hey, grab a bag of popcorn and sit in the Lazy Boy and watch this. It's not a passive watchfulness, but this is a watchfulness that he's calling us to that infers readiness to action when needed. A watchfulness with the intent of being ready to act. On behalf of ourselves, on behalf of someone else. Essentially, maybe calling them to, calling them to, to, to awareness. Say, hey, I don't know if you noticed this, but I noticed that there's danger here. Be watchful. Be watchful. Another thing that the Apostle Paul tells us here in this text is to stand firm in the faith. Meaning this, persevere, persist, or to keep one standing, or to continue. In the faith. It has to be said that this is not general faith in whatever. You hear that at different times where people say, oh, you just have to have faith. Oh, you just, just got to keep the faith. We're not talking about general faith in just whatever, but, but in Jesus Christ. And this, is, this is perseverance or, or, or standing in, in the faith, meaning your position and trust in the Lord. Or in the knowledge of the truth. We have to stop here for a second and just say this. That, that men, fellows, if, if you are not in Christ. And, and what I mean by that is if you are not a disciple of Jesus. If you haven't come to the understanding that you are a wretched sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. And you've submitted yourself to Him. Trusting in Him for, for saving you from your sin which results in you serving Him as Lord. If, if you're not in Christ, my brother, you cannot fulfill your God-given purpose and mission as a man. We're talking about encouragement as, for, for men and, and looking at clarity of mission. You, you, can't, you can't rightly fulfill your mission as a man, as God has intended, if you are not in Christ. Because what that means is that that's you being in submission to God. And nobody can be a good soldier. Nobody can, can have the correct mission unless they are submitted to the authority above them. You can't be rogue and be on mission. And so I would encourage you in this, guys, that if you haven't come to faith in Jesus, um, that today's that day. What a fantastic Father's Day it would be if you come to place your, your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ. But to stand firm in the faith, as we are His, as we're His disciples, and we are desiring to live a life honoring to Him and follow Him. Power just blinked off. I hope this still works okay. But as we are His disciples and we are wanting to continue and, and follow Him, this standing firm in the faith, this is a picture of not wavering or stumbling or being easily moved. This is like someone standing firm. I think about uh, perhaps a lineman on the football field. They need to stand firm. And, and what are some things that need to happen for them to do that? I uh, think about the football field. It gets pretty greasy. It gets pretty muddy, slick, tore up, whatever. And, and these guys are getting pushed by some big guys on the other side. One of the things they need, they need some cleats. They need cleats that are going to dig into the ground to help them keep their footing because they don't want to slip. They need to stand firm. Them standing firm has everything to do with the success of the mission. Stand firm in the faith. And so if we think about us as disciples not wavering, not stumbling, not being easily moved, what is it that makes that possible? Men, listen, one of the things that's absolutely necessary is for our walk with Christ to be of primary importance. To be of primary importance. I don't know what has taken that, 
that place of prominence in your life. But if it's not your walk with Jesus, oh, my, my brother, I, I challenge you to get clarity of mission. Oh, all of this, my brothers, is, gonna, is going to help us fulfill the duty that we've been called to do. May our walk with Christ be of primary importance. Second like unto it is this, must be rooted in and nourished by the Word of God. So that we are not carried about by every wind and doctrine. We have to be saturated with the Word of God because we need to know the truth. We need to know the truth. You've got to know what is in the Word so that you know what is false. Uh, there, are things, there are things that are going to bombard us. There are things that we're going to um, we're, we're going to come across our path. There are things that we're going to hear that we have no idea if, we're, if we are being alert and we are hearing the things and seeing the things. We have no idea what's right and what's wrong. We have no idea what is true doctrine and what is false doctrine unless we are saturated in the Word. Be rooted in and nourished by the Word of God. So stand firm in the faith. And then he goes on to say, act like men. And that's what the ESV says. That's the translated, um, what, what the ESV translate that, that Greek into. Perhaps your translation says to be, be brave or, or to be mature. This is a picture of, of brave, mature courage. And this is what he's calling us to. And, and, and so men, as, as we're thinking about us and our role and, and desiring to be encouraged and challenged in it, act like men. Be brave and courageous. Because it's going to take that. Us, us being called to our duty, us being called to, to the role that God has given to us is going to take courage. It's going to take bravery. It's not all a walk in the park. You know, you think about the different missions that, that those in our <clears throat> military have gone on. We think of some of the, the historic ones. I think of the, the D-Day invasion. That took some serious courage. It took some serious bravery. What in the world is that? Listen, courage or bravery, you've probably heard something like this before, and I've seen some quotes, and I've I kind of just mishmashed a couple of them together. <laughs> courage isn't the absence of fear, but it is acting in the face of fear, because what's needed to be done is more important than what you're afraid of. And I'm going to read that one more time. As we're being called to act like men and to have this brave, mature courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, as though we are void of fear. But it is acting in the face of that fear. Because what's needed to be done is more important than what you're afraid of. There are a lot of things that, that hinder us because, frankly, we're afraid. And, and us as guys aren't necessarily real quick to admit the fact that we're afraid. But there are things that, there are things that, that cause us to, to, to tremble. Uh, it causes us to, to, to be reluctant to do something because of what maybe the outcome would be or, or how people would think or, or perhaps how it's gone in the past. Listen, then we've been called to, to do what it is that we've been called to do, uh, to, to be watchful to stand firm in the faith, to, to, to do for our children and our wives and for the rest of those around us. We call to act on their behalf. Sometimes conflict is one of those things that, that, that makes us fearful, that we don't want to act because, because of potential conflict somewhere, or, or we don't want to act because of a fear of our, of our past. Maybe there's something we want to warn somebody about. However, who are we to speak to that because of what happened in the past? My brothers, we're, to, we're called to, to be brave. We're called to mature courage. 
Again, courage isn't the absence of fear, but it is acting in the face of fear because what's needed to be done is more important than what you're afraid of. Similarly, he calls us then to be strong. He says, be strong. And, and this meaning to be strengthened or to make strong or to increase in strength. How many of you guys know that the reason you're in the kitchen is to open the pickle jar? <laughs> now, this is from a guy who doesn't even like pickles. And so when i got to open that pickle jar, i got to be extra careful that I don't spill any of that pickle juice on me because I don't like it. I've oftentimes been asked by my wife or my kids to, to do something for them because it requires strength, strength that they don't have. And us as men, it's not a surprise, not, a, not news, that, that men are, tend to be physically stronger than women and children. And while we are physically stronger than women and children, and, and we should use that as an asset in our mission, Physical strength is not what is primarily in view here. When the Apostle Paul calls us to be strong, this, this isn't calling us to, to go to the gym five times a week. Oh, physical training is of some value, the Apostle Paul says, but, but godliness is much more. Okay, and so this is not talking about physical strength. This denotes inner spiritual strength and growth. Ironically, the strength that we're called to here in this text is, is to increase as we acknowledge our weakness. And it's to increase as we depend upon the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 12, 4 and following, the Apostle Paul is talking about this thorn in the flesh that he was given. Again, we don't know exactly what that is. A lot of speculation. But... But he talks about this thorn in the flesh that, that was given to him for the purpose, just boiling this down, for the purpose of his humility and his depending upon the Lord. And what it is that he said there was after he asked the Lord three times to take it away and God said no, God said, actually, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength, it will be made perfect in your weakness. And so as we're called to be strong here, ironically, this strength that we're called to is, is increased as we acknowledge our weakness and our dependence upon the Lord. And so, men, we're called to be strong. It's not to, to be the, the all in all to everybody. Hey, buck up, man, be strong, because you have to do this for your family. That's not what he's talking about. Essentially, when we're called to be biblically strong, we're called to be totally and utterly dependent upon the Lord. I don't know if your family has witnessed you being that way or not, but I would encourage you to allow them to see you that way. Our level of acknowledged dependence on and submission to him determines the level of our strength. Because as we are weak, his strength is made evident in us. And this is the strength necessary to carry out our mission. By the way, what is some of that strength used for? What is some of the strength of the Lord used for? I'll just point you as an example to uh, Philippians 4, 13. Now, that's a verse that perhaps a lot of you men um, and others have quoted many times. Maybe it's on a coffee cup or maybe it's on a uh, sports bag. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this is pointing to the strength of God in our lives. It's necessary for us to do what it is that we need to do. But what does he give us that strength for? Well, in that text directly, the context is the Apostle Paul saying, I have been content in all things. I have learned the secret of being content in my need with great want, and I have learned the secret of being content with great abundance. Then he says, I can do all of these things through Christ who strengthens me. And so the strength that the Lord provides is for us to handle life, the frustrations as well as the joys. Be strong. 
And then he tells us something that, that we, we might expect in a women's conference. But maybe not necessarily to men. However, it is for us men. In verse 14, he says this, Let all that you do be done in love. I can just see, you know, perhaps a commander and the army saying, All right, men, get out there in love. And everybody perhaps will look at him like, something about that just doesn't sound right. Listen, love, men, is not a women's thing. Love is not, is not relegated to women. Love is something that should be at the very core of us and our mission. Love actually should be the motivation and the tone of our mission. It shouldn't be self-promotion. It shouldn't be self-interest. It shouldn't be rage and it shouldn't be revenge. And not even for the enemy. That's something that's pretty typical in a in in modern warfare is rage or or, or hatred for the enemy. That should not be the motivation and the tone of us and our mission, guys. And I would suggest to you this, not even rage and anger at Satan, the enemy of our souls, the one who wants to have us and our families for lunch. The motivation of our mission should not be even hatred of him. The motivation of our mission, what should saturate and permeate everything that we do, should be love. As a matter of fact, it should be love for, for the Lord because in doing this is as though we're doing it for the Lord, right? Motivation should be love for the Lord and it should be love for and the care of others. This must be how we deal with our wives and children. This must be how we deal with our wives and children. Guys, as we're being strong, as we're being courageous, as we're being watchful, as we're standing firm in our faith, being aware that God has called us to this, this is how we must do all of this, is permeated with love. This is how we must deal with our wives and children. It must be the whole motivation for our watchfulness. Because we love and we care about our relationship with, with the Father. Because we love and we care about our family. Because we love and we care about our brothers and sisters. It must be the tone of our strength. It must be the reason for our courage. Listen, it must even be the reason that we have the confrontations that we need to have. I just want to read for you a, a, a quote from John MacArthur regarding this. In speaking about this, this love, he says this, It is the beautiful softening principle, because we as men sometimes need to be softened and toned down a little bit, right? He says it. It is the beautiful softening principle. It keeps our firmness from becoming hardness and our strength from becoming domineering. It keeps our maturity gentle and considerate. It keeps our right doctrine from becoming obstinate dogmatism and our right living from becoming smug self-righteousness. Love is essential to the mission. And so, fellas, I just want to encourage you, you, you may be a father in, in any stage of the game. Perhaps you're brand new and you still have no idea what you're doing. Um, let me give you some encouragement. I still have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> or perhaps you're one of the old guys, one of the seasoned veterans who, who no longer have kids in your home. You no longer uh, need to care for them because they are grown. They're adults. As a matter of fact, they have kids and perhaps grandkids of their own. 
I want to encourage you fathers in any stage of life that you have been given this role by God. My friend, be encouraged. Because this role is not something that was just like a secondary thing. Like you can do nothing else. So here, we're just going to put you over here in the role of father. What you have to do, my friend, is so greatly important. And I know sometimes we're tempted to think that it's not. But your role is extremely important. Okay, be encouraged. It's been given to you by the Lord, and he has given us instruction. The one who has called us and given us purpose has given us instruction and clarity of mission. And we only looked at some of it today. And I also want to talk to you men before we close here that, that are not fathers Maybe you used to be fathers, or maybe you haven't become father yet. Or you never have. I, I want to encourage you to look for those around you that you can love like this, that you can serve. Because God has called you to the role of a man. And maybe you won't ever be called father by someone. but you can fill some of the shoes. So men, fathers, you were made on purpose and with a purpose. You've been given a mission. Act like men. According to the design of the one who created you and called you, he is faithful. And he is a great example and a template for how it is that we should be about the mission. Father God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for uh, instruction and encouragement that you give us. I thank you for, for dads. Lord, I thank you for making us, uh, making us different and on purpose. But we sure praise you for women, and we praise you for mothers. <laughs> My goodness, where would we be without them? But we are grateful that you, you have called us to to, to, to this mission. Help us to, to be about it with everything that we have. Help us to be about it for your honor and your glory. Being watchful, Father, for our lives because they matter, for the lives of those around us. Help us to stand firm in the faith. Help us to be in the faith, first of all, and then stand firm in it, saturating ourselves with your word so we know truth from error, so that we can speak up when when there is error, so we can warn when there's error, and that we can know how to live rightly. Help us, oh God, to, to be brave and courageous, ready to act, even when it's not the most comfortable thing to do. Help us to be strong, depending upon you for everything that we need. And Lord, help us to do everything we do in love. I pray that everything we do would be saturated and permeated. The words and the tones and all the deeds be done in love. We thank you, Father, for your great love for us. We thank you for fathers. We thank you for manhood. Um, we thank you for the role that you placed us in. I pray your hand a blessing upon the guys that have been listening. And for those who come alongside them, for the ladies, for the kids, I pray that they would step in and, and encourage these men. Help them to, to, to know that what they're doing is not pointless. We thank you, Lord, for your great grace toward us, for Jesus Christ, the only Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. Um, glad you could uh, be with us via video. Uh, I pray that you would continue to get into the Word, to saturate yourself in it, and, and, and look back into that Nehemiah chapter 4 uh, as you look at these two passages side by side. Until next time, uh, I pray that you, uh, you have a, an increased hunger and desire for, for the Word. I pray that you would seek the Lord in His face um, always and, uh, and glorify Him in everything you do. All right, love you guys. We'll catch you next time.